So this is leveraging an enterprise-ready vCloud service to regain IT control format. I'm Jason Carlin, Director of Cloud Solution Development at VMware. So I work in the, in the cloud solutions organization responsible for bringing the vCloud data center services out to market and deal a lot with uh, third-party integration around some of the areas that we're going to talk about today. So compliance and security and, and systems management and monitoring. I'd also like to introduce the members of our panel, and I will apologize, I think on the conference material we had uh, three, three listed, and, and unfortunately uh, uh, one was not able to make it today. But I have John Willis, VP of Services, and uh, he's got a longer title than that, v VP of Training, Services, and Evangelism at OpsCode. He has three decades of battling IT complexity experience. Prior to OpsCode, he was at Gulf Breeze Software, an IBM business partner, wrote six red books with IBM and trained more than 10,000 people on Tivoli worldwide. He was also the cloud evangelist at Canonical, and he's based in Atlanta. And I'm also joined with, uh, by Pat O'Day, the CTO of Blue Lock. Pat has 15 years of IT experience, both in the enterprise space as well as the service provider space. Um, I like his, his, his description because it's both engineering in terms of defining the architecture that Blue Lock provides to its customers as services, but also making sure that there is a, a business aspect of it as well. And I think that's a, a common theme that we heard this morning in terms of linking IT up with really the demands for the business and flexibility and, and trying to regain control over cost and so forth. Pat's also the co-founder and former president of the local associate, Association of Internet Professionals and former board member of the Technology Peer Group for TechPoint, Indiana's only statewide information technology association. Pat's also a VMware customer advisory panel member. This is the standard disclaimer. Please read that. There'll be a test later. Um, so I'm going to spend just a couple of, of minutes just sort of setting the stage, and then I'll pass it over to, uh, to John and to Pat, who will give us some more, some more information on, on both what their companies do, but I think also their perspectives in terms of what the cloud world is like today. I think you'll find it really interesting. I think it's, it's uh, pretty dynamic. John's, John's discussion is very dynamic. And, and Pat actually has some real-world experience in terms of, of looking at the vCloud Director product, implementing it at Blue Lock. So I hope um, we get into some good Q&A a little bit later where we go into some of the design considerations and, and discuss maybe in more detail uh, what a vCloud Director environment might look like and, and what some of the, 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 the um, advantages are. Um, audience participation is key, so hopefully uh, you guys will ask some hard questions. Um, I will maybe ask to keep the questions to the end. I'll make sure we have uh, a, a good you know, 20 minutes of, of Q&A time. Um, so we heard this this morning in terms of the you know, business demands and really trying to deal with this balance of, of complexity and, and cost and time to market, but yet still having a very flexible environment. Um, a lot of the, the emphasis around cloud today is, is sort of the evolution of virtualization and is something that, that you can better manage your IT services um, internally. But as, as you all know, the capacity issue, 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 the issues inside today's data centers um, are, are, are something that most people are worried about. The uh, time that it takes to be able to deploy services is still an issue. The, the cost, the risk up front to, to sort of deploy hardware versus looking at really a service provider solution or a public cloud solution where it can span these workloads over that environment. Um, some of the, the you know, real concerns I, I talk to customers about are really around security and compliance and transparency. They want to know what's really happening behind the scenes. And we have some ideas and thoughts around that. And if we, it doesn't come out during the presentations, we'll make sure we discuss it at the Q&A. Um, I guess in terms of, of the announcements today and looking at the cloud platform, we're really focused on trying to provide compatibility between what's happening inside your data center and, and bringing it to a service provider environment like Blue Lock and being able to have that transparency and visibility in, in terms of what your applications are doing. We also look at, at this balance of control and, and self-provisioning and automation and really providing more comprehensive solutions um, to, to enable better time to market, to reduce complexity, I think John's going to talk about that in some of his presentations as well. So without uh, further ado, I will uh, hand it over to John, John Willis with OpsCode.
All right. So um, my name is John Willis. I'm the VP of Services at a company called Ops Code, and I'll tell you a little bit about that in a little bit. Um, um, if you had any questions or anything, I'm John at Ops Code, so it's pretty, pretty easy. So like everybody in this room, right, we're all on Twitter. I'm uh, Bachika Loop on Twitter. Which, it's a horrible name, but, you know, <laughs> I picked it real early. And can't change it now, so. Um, but um, I'm also, um, if you notice from the picture there, I'm the evil Dr. Doofenshmirtz. My kids kind of took control of it. But more importantly is, like, this is kind of my life in IT, is when all you have is a hammer, everything looks like an IT infrastructure, right? And, and so I'm an ops guy, right? I, I like talking about ops. I, I work for a company that's, like, completely focused on ops, you know, infrastructure and ops. I do a couple of podcast series. I got one uh, called IT Management Podcast where, uh, with Red Monk Analyst Group. And we, we like to think of ourselves as the, you know, the, cl the click and clack guys. For cars, we're like that for IT management, right? So we just cut up and talk about IT management. Um, recently, I've been doing something called DevOps Cafe. How many people have heard of DevOps? So yeah, so a few, right? So it's it's kind of a cultural movement. It's taking, you know, it, it's a, a cultural. Some people describe it as a cultural and professional movement. Um, it, it's it, it's coming out of the kind of agile people. They're kind of forcing this, like agile development is forcing kind of agile infrastructure. And, and it's really exciting. I mean, there's a lot of stuff out there already on it. There's already conferences. And so I've been doing, you know, because again, it fits in line with what I love to do, was, which is ops. And so DevOps Cafe. And probably the reason I'm in this room right now is because my cloud cafe that I've done for the last three years or so, or the Cloud Cafe podcast. Um, so anyway, that, that's me. Um, the thing is, I've been doing this for, like, like you said, was 30 years now, right? So. Um, you know, and, and the thing is, I, I, I give this longer presentation where I talk about, like, what do developers want? What does IT want, right? And, and so, you know, what does IT want? Like, we're like, like I say, we're like cicadas, right? Like, like every 10 years for us, we got a shorter hibernation period, right? But, but as ops guys, like, every 10 years, the world gets so crazy. Like, things get out of control. And, and if you like this stuff, right, then we get to kind of come in and, like, figure out how to clean things up a little bit, right? So, um, you know, so for me, that's, like, about having fun, right? I love doing this, right? So it, it's about, you know, we're in one of these periods right now, and I'll talk about obvious it's cloud, right? But, but like, if you look, like, in my experience, you know, in the 80s, you had, um, you know, kind of mainframe and distributed computing, right? And, and it, was, it was one of these loss of control um, shifts or industry shifts, right? There were groups going out, and uh, most people look a lot younger than me in this room, but, you know, there was called the client-server movement. And what happened was the mainframe glass houses controlled everything. And, 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 and a lot of the large, you know, Fortune 500, Fortune 1000 companies, they had pretty good control. I mean, they were doing change management and, you know, things like that back even in the 80s, right? It was pretty disciplined, problem management, change management. But then all of a sudden, like, this whole distributed computing client-server thing started, and, like, groups or pockets of divisions, while they were waiting six months for the mainframe glass house to give them a solution and go through a committee process of approval, they were actually going out and buying client-server solutions. You know, and then ops guys had to wreak the, the havoc and get all that back under control. And then we had the, the 90s, right, the Internet, right? Like, large enterprises started just rolling out web servers, you couldn't get enough of them, right? And, and nobody was like, they were like, I don't know what those guys are doing. They, they, they got 10, you know, 10 sun servers are on a dock today, and I think there'll be 40 tomorrow, right? So you had the, the whole 90s thing, right? And, then, and again, it was kind of a, a cleanup. And, you know, if you look at year 2000 for the most part, right, what, what was the thing we had to kind of do a lot of work with and clean up is virtualization, right? Virtualization kind of sprawled, um, you know, I got a, a face there, but somewhere between, you know, some people started early, but in large enterprises, I mean, somewhere between 2002 and 2007, there has been this, like, I, like, what they say this morning, that, like, anywhere from 30 to 50 percent of, you know, all enterprises are virtualized at this point, right? So, I mean, so it's virtualization. I mean, 30 percent of, like, millions of servers is a big deal, right? So we've had to deal with that. And now, in 2010, we have the cloud. Right? And so the cloud is just another one of these areas where, you know, that, that, like, it's going to happen. And you're going to have to put up your, like, we know, like, there's patterns here. 
that we know are going to happen. Like, we've, if you follow the, the bouncing ball, right, you, you know, like, this is probably going to happen. Let's not wait to go, you know, wake up like the cicadas that we are. Let's get control over it in front of, ahead of time, right? So, and the patterns that, that, that you see in all these, the, you know, the, the 80s, the 90s, and, you know, if virtualization and now a cloud is, like, two things that happen, like, one is that um, there's a there's something called uh, what is it a Devin's pa- Jared's paradox I got it mixed up now but what it means is it's called componentization hierarchy and that is the more we automate oh why did we lose the screen hibernating ah okay it was uh, it was loose sorry about that. So, um, so the more we automate, the more, actually more work we wind up doing, the more we consume. The more, more efficient we make things, the more consumable they become, the more work. In other words, the more work that us as ops guys get to do. Like I, I, try, I like to say that operations is about um, providing self-service operations to developers, right? And, and so if you think about it, like people in large organizations that are going out to companies like Amazon, right, this, like I can put my credit card in and I can get services, right, but, and, and even like what Paul Moritz said this morning, right, he said that, like, they got 15 SASs and he didn't approve any of them, right, right, because they're going out and doing it, and the, and the key is, why are they doing that, right, and, and the reason is, they've got what Randy Bias is, is, is kind of a cloud evangelist as well, he calls it, you know, frictionless IT, like, people want the ability to get self-service capabilities, right? They want to be able to say, I want this, and I've got my choice. I can go here and go through a committee or a process that seems really long, or I can pull my credit card out and I can do this, right? And most people are going to choose to pull your credit card out. So what operations has to do is put in place an infrastructure that gives them that self, you know, self-service, IT, frictionless IT, um, but with the boundaries, right? So... I mean, so the thing is that, again, where we're at right now is cloud is inevitable. And cloud is inevitable for a couple of reasons. One, because um, ephemeral infrastructure, right? The idea that you can get a service or build a service within like 10 minutes and keep it for four hours and then it goes away, right? Like the demands on on us today are, are a lot more complex than they were like three years ago. And in, you know, in five years, they're going to be like extremely more complex, right? We've got, you know, like most of your mobile apps today are what large scale web operations, right? So the, the thing is that the, your customers' customers are demanding the capability of, you know, of basically, um, having ephemeral infrastructure. I get it when I want it. I want it provisioned. You've heard the stories about like eight weeks, eight minutes, right? Those kind of stories. Like they know they can get that, right? Um, the, you get the, the pay as you go, right? I need to go ahead and spin up 100 servers for three hours, right? There are like a lot of companies now, even the financial institutes are using commodity infrastructure to go ahead and do risk analysis, because now there's open source tools out there where not only can somebody do kind of a, a Monte Carlo or a risk analysis without having to go pre-allocate the servers that, that you have for like every year, they can go get 100 ephemeral servers, run this Monte Carlo, run this risk simulation, and then like it's gone. Right, so and then like in the life sciences, the same thing. Researchers, right? They they can do computations for you know they can again spin up ten, fifty, a hundred servers to go ahead and get you know maybe what is it a one or a zero to put into this algorithm, right? So those are the demands that are on us, right? So um, so again, I think that our job is to basically provide that and give a control level. So the the, the question then also is, and why am I here, and you know what led me to Blue Lock? Right, so the thing is, I'm going to tell you a little bit about what Ops Code does and, and what, what we do in, in a minute, but um, we come out of kind of the web operating space, right? So most of our customers have been customers that use commodity clouds, right? Uh, a lot of, we got a lot of Amazon web service. They're usually startups. They're bleeding edge, right? And um, 
But what we haven't had a lot of success with is enterprise customers. Now, we've got a lot of customers that, that use v, vSphere, and we've got interfaces to vSphere. But what, what interested us in BlueLock is that they provide this kind of everything that we want out of a commodity cloud, like the ability to provision quick, to have the cloud capabilities that you need, that the startups require, um, and, but then also give us the kind of enterprise leg, right? Get, get us, because, you know, the Blue Lock seemed, to, in our research, to, to have the best kind of enterprise story from a public cloud standpoint. So, and then the fact that they, they've partnered with vCloud, and, you know, our goal is to go into start, you know, moving our vSphere stuff to vCloud as well, right? It's, it's a double win, right? So, so uh, again, that's why, you know, that's why we're a customer and a partner with, with uh, Blue Lock. So, so what Ops Code does is if you think about um, cloud, and you think about like getting from, from left to right, like in, in the left is, I want cloud instances. I want to get like six servers, six instances. But what I really want is a full running stack, right? And so the way I kind of describe cloud from a configuration management standpoint is breaking up into three processes. The first process is provisioning. I want the ability to invoke an API to give me, in this case, this example, six instances. But when I'm done making that call to the API, all I have is six green blobs, right? I mean, don't, I don't really know from, like a, um, from an inventory or configuration managed database perspective what it is, right? I mean, if they're pre-baked images, I can assume that they're like the templates that they came from, and that might be okay. But what I really need is the second step, which is to basically turn those blobs into like desired state components, right? I want like the two in the middle there and the green to be web servers in this case. I want the one on the top to be either, you know, um, a logical or uh, a virtual load balancer. And I want a database master and I want slaves, right? So I want these, these instances that I provisioned to become something. Now, again, they could have been, there's kind of two schools of thought. There's the just enough operating system, where they start off everything all the same or the same operating system, everything's the same, and then there's an agent that turns them into or they become that desired state. Like, that's configuration manager's core. Or they start off as pre-built images that are, like, almost there. And then configuration management kind of finishes it, finishing touches to turn it into something. But even when I'm done with configuration management, I'm still just two-thirds of the way there. What I really need is I need the load balancer to know where the web servers are, and I don't want to manually configure anything. You know, frictionless IT, right? I don't want to get to here and then have a developer have to then go update something, right? I, I want to be able to, what I really want is I want the push button. The promise of the cloud is I get, I've got, like, let's take the Java example. I got a war file, and I want to put the war file here. And I want that process to happen. I want this, the provisioning. I want the, 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 the componentry around that WAR file, the Tomcat, the databases to be built the way they're supposed to be. And then I want the web servers to automatically know where the database master is and where the slaves are. And I don't want to have to stop and do any manual process for that, right? And so that's kind of the last mile, which is system integration. And that's, that's what OpsCode does. And then if you think about what BlueLock does, like and vCloud, right? That's the provisioning and, you know, in some cases, a good part of the configuration management. Whereas, you know, ops code with BlueLock, you had that kind of last layer, which is system integration. So, so the bottom line is like, you know, you know if you think and you've heard enough about cloud um, this week, then, you know, then the story is like, prepare, you know? Like, don't be this little kid on the tricycle, right? You know, um, you know get your house in order. Um, it may never come. You may be in an organization where it's... I, I, I just recently did some work for the Joint Warfare Analysis Center, which is part of the Navy. I mean, this is like deep black box people, right? And um, black ops stuff, right? And like, they're talking about cloud. I mean, in a limited space, but they're talking about what they can do with the cloud. So, so don't kid yourself that like, you know, well, I'm such and such company and we're never going to go to the cloud because the DOD is talking very serious about cloud. Bank of America has already got a, a really interesting cloud strategy, right? So, um, so you just need to be prepared. That's all I have. Great. Thanks, John. Sure.
So um, Pat O'Day, I'm the CTO for Blue Lock. And uh, if you saw the keynote this morning, you saw that we were one of the three uh, launch partners in North America for vCloud Data Center, which is a new initiative from VMware. And um, I'm just going to talk a little bit about how we got there and really show you some of the things we can do uh, that we couldn't do before. So um, Blue Lock, uh, all we do is VMware-based cloud hosting. So we don't have telecommunications business. We don't have a colocation business that we've been managing for a while. Uh, we all came from those backgrounds, but we're a pure VMware customer. So we, we kind of have a, a unique VMware-based view of the world. Um, we have clients large and small. We have very small software as a service companies that have two or three VMs, and we have Fortune 500 companies that have much bigger uh, virtual environments in our cloud. Um, really, the, the biggest thing probably about me that you should know is I spent the first 10 years of my IT career as a systems administrator on the inside of the enterprise in large companies. And then I decided I, I got a little comeuppity, I guess, and I decided to go out and start a company I went on the outside, took all the risk, and uh, that's a whole different conversation. But the most surprising thing for me was the minute I left the enterprise, how quickly I was looked at like the enemy by all my friends that were on the inside. Because now we were competing for jobs, for the same budget dollars, uh, that they had really, they had careers inside these companies. Um, they wanted to do the projects, they wanted to do the implementation, they wanted to build the networks, build the storage, they wanted to do everything that they've been doing for years, and we were on the outside offering hosted solutions, uh, which in theory might make their jobs go away. So the interesting twist this year for Blue Lock was that the majority of our business had been with companies that, um, for example, software vendors or software as a service companies. The majority of them don't build their own data centers, they don't build their own infrastructure, they would rather hire developers, product managers, uh, marketing people, sales people, and not spend it on network engineers, storage engineers, and whatnot. So they're already in the mindset of they don't need to build their own infrastructure. They're happy to outsource that, and they don't want to do any of it themselves. Um, when we did run into a company that was mixed in that they had some infrastructure expertise, they wanted to accomplish a new initiative, they were always debating about whether or not they should do that internally or externally. And I found myself sitting across the table again, facing my old friends, the IT staff, who again were thinking the same thing, that we're here to replace them. The change this year is that, uh, exactly like John described, is that those workloads are leaving whether we're in the conversation or not. So the business units are going to Amazon, they're going to GoGrid, they're going to Salesforce, they're going wherever they can to get, I think you described it as frictionless, IT, and so the IT department is starting to see erosion all around them, and there's really nothing that they can do. Um, I've seen people try to put in procedures in their procurement department to force, you know, any technology decision that's made has to go through them for approval, and if it's a credit card-based thing, procurement never sees it until it's after already been purchased, so it never happens. So we started to get calls from the IT organization, which is really a big pleasant surprise for me, because again, those were my old friends. Uh, and they said, you know, we've got this problem. We're starting to lose workloads to these providers. They can beat us on price, and they're not doing all the things that we do. So they're not delivering the security, they're not delivering the compliance. Um, sometimes it doesn't even make sense to put that application in the cloud, but it's getting out there anyway. And uh, we think because we have VMware, and you're based on VMware, that there's got to be something we can do together. Because you look the most like what we've built ourselves. So we talked to VMware about that, and it really came down to these, these things. Um, it had to be VMware-based. We need to be able to provide self-service because users are comfortable doing these things themselves now. Had to be able to move the workloads into the cloud and back out. So if we, uh, you know, we, if for some reason the business needed to move quickly, the capital budget wasn't there. They could put an application into the cloud, but when the capital came back and they could buy the new SAN, they wanted to be able to move that back inside. And they wanted to be in control of the whole process. So we can't have two GUIs to, you know, from an operational standpoint. This is probably the biggest surprise for me, and it makes total sense uh, once I thought about it. 
but it's the idea of taking uh, you know, 50 IT operations staff and training them on another control panel just because you picked a particular cloud provider. So even if you pick a cloud provider, the operational expense of managing those two interfaces and maybe even three and maybe even four if you start to pick more cloud providers based on price point or whatever, it just didn't make any sense. So they felt kind of trapped. So we started to work with VMware on the Redwood project probably a year ago. And as you know, it uh, evolved into vCloud Director. And it really uh, helped us solve a lot of those problems. So we're, you know, our customers today are a mix of people who just have VMware or they've implemented VMware with all the operational controls and self-service using some kind of management tool work to make it kind of cloud-like. But we're calling it all private cloud today because we think eventually it will go there. So we, uh, Director, the first thing it gave us was the ability to import and export virtual machines in and out of the environment. Uh, that had been elusive, uh, but it works extremely well. Those of you that are, I'm assuming everybody here is a VMware customer in some way. Um, so you're used to the vSphere client, which is a tool to manage your VMware environment. And Director gave us a different user interface. It's web-based. Looks a lot different than vSphere client, but you could come in and manage the public cloud. And you saw in the demonstration today where they were in one vSphere environment, and then they went over to the cloud, and they were provisioning workloads back and forth. The gap that we saw was when we showed our customers the director interface, it had all the features that they needed, but we were back to that operational training issue where everybody they had was trained and certified on how to run the vSphere client and had no idea how to run the director interface. So we built a uh, connector using the vCloud API that basically allows them to manage vCloud director using vSphere client. So their operation folks see it. It looks exactly the same. They've got public cloud, private cloud right in the same interface. So I'm just going to show you what these things look like. Um, and you saw a little bit of the keynote today. We'll show you a couple more of the features. So probably the biggest thing about Director, if you're an existing VMware customer, is it's a web-based application. So there's no thick client you don't have to install on your desktop. You can access it from anywhere. It's also got um, hierarchical uh, user-based access control. So a systems administrator can log in and have the ability to build virtual data centers, but a developer can log in, and the only thing that they can do is provision vApps and virtual machines inside the data center that the systems administrator set up. Other people can come in and just run uh, you know, network-based resources. Once you log in, the biggest, the biggest core concept here is the idea of a virtual data center. So as a provider, what we were challenged to do by our customers was to deliver as much control as they felt comfortable with. But at the same time, because we have more than one customer, and in some cases we have customers that have multiple data centers inside of our cloud, their data centers couldn't interfere with each other. So if they had a SharePoint application that was built for their R&D lab, and they had a, uh, or it was probably, they had a large uh, computing cluster built in the R&D lab, but then they had a SharePoint environment set up for their sales force. If they were maximizing their resource utilization, those two applications couldn't interfere with each other. And by the way, you know, Smith Corporation can't interfere with Acme from our side. So with Director, we were able to build resource, large resource groups, 100 gigahertz of compute, 300 gigs of RAM, 10 terabytes of storage, classify that as a virtual data center, as a sandbox, and they hand complete control over it to the end user. So they can go in and they can configure the networking. They can basically do anything they want inside of that, and it has no impact on any of the other uh, players in, in the cloud environment. Once you build your virtual data center, inside of it you start to create virtual applications. So here we've got e-commerce, Exchange, and uh, SharePoint 2007. If you go inside of the virtual application, you see each of the virtual machines. You can click on the black box, and it will pull up a console that is the basically like you're standing at the keyboard in front of the physical server. So if you have a blue screen of death or something goes wrong with the application, you can't get SSH or remote desktop into it, you just log into the web portal here, click on it, and you're standing in front of the machine. You can capture the error message, or if you think you can recover it, go ahead and recover it. Or if you just need to power off, you can do that. 
So this is, again, this could be the systems administrator, this could be the developer, it could be the storage engineer, it could be the marketing person rebooting the website, it could be kind of anything. Um, it also brought us this idea of catalogs. So and this is, again, uh, something that John was talking about. It's the idea of allowing people to very quickly provision pre-configured environments. The catalogs uh, come as a public and a private catalog. So the private catalog would be if uh, one of our customers decided that they had their particular implementation of SharePoint. So they put the backup agent on it, they put the antivirus agent on it that they like. Maybe they have uh, a particular management tool, typically, or whatever, uh, some kind of agent. They could configure that themselves, save it as a template, and then every SharePoint environment that they provisioned would already have all that built in. As a provider, uh, maybe they are interested in just getting Windows 2008 from us. So we can create a publish that's basically an app store with our catalog of pre VMs and virtual applications that they can consume. And the neat thing is they could consume a template out of our catalog sorry, and uh, configure it th themselves and then save it back as their own private catalog. So you can start to move things in and out. There's also a concept, I think, Ben, that you can take something in your private catalog and share it with uh, other users. So you get some collaboration. I don't know we see that across um, end user customers, but I can see one department getting a particular application configured and then sharing that template with another department that's in a different security context. Uh, the neatest thing about this particular interface is that little button right there. Because if you click on it, you can actually upload your own OVF workloads. So if you go into your existing VMware environment and you pick a V app or you pick a virtual machine and you export it into OVF format, and it could be on your VMware workstation, it could be in vSphere, as long as it is in that format. Pull it off of your uh, desktop or your network drive. In this case, we've got an Oracle 11G environment. Hit the upload button. It uploads into Director. And now it's a new virtual application or virtual machine you can use. The other thing uh, important from a lock-in perspective is if you would build a application environment or even a whole data center in the public cloud, you can come back later, go into your virtual application, click on it, and download it. And again, it's downloaded as an OVF formatted environment, so you can move it over into your own private vSphere environment. So you have put SharePoint out there, you let marketing do their thing, the campaign's over, you want to move it back inside as an internal application, you download it and you're done. The uh, probably the most amazing and yet complex thing inside a director is the network configuration. Um, I think our, our phrase was there's almost too much flexibility in here. But uh, the neat thing is within this virtual data center, within this sandbox that can't hurt anybody else, you can go in and configure some pretty interesting network features. So you have your own DHCP server. That's probably the most popular question we've gotten at the show is, so I've got my application, it's running inside my data center today, I want to upload it into the cloud, what happens to the networking? So when you export it as an OVF, you can strip out the network information, you can put in a new IP address. If you strip out the network information and upload it, and you have a DHCP running, uh, server running in your virtual data center, it just picks up a new IP address and, it's, and off you go. But you can do the firewall, uh, firewalling and network address translation. And again, a developer, systems administrator can configure any of this, it won't impact any other customers because it's all occurring inside your own data center. So the last thing I want to show you is the cloud connector. So this is the uh, vSphere client. There, uh, if you go to the Blue Hawk website, you can download, uh, and you have a uh, proof of concept director account with us, you can download the plugin. It's a Java plugin. Uh, once you install it, a Blue Lock icon appears in vSphere client. You click on it, and you can see that the we're still inside of vSphere Client, but now I'm managing the same two virtual data centers that I built in vCloud Director. So as I open those up, you see the same list of uh, virtual applications and virtual machines. You can manage the resources. You can stop, start, suspend, restart. And at the bottom, uh, if you look over there, you can see that the public and private cloud catalog are also available. So you go in, and you can provision right out of the catalog just like you could. So if you have an operational issue where your staff is not yet ready to move to the director interface, 
or maybe that's a higher, you, your senior engineers can do that, but your operations folks at midnight, uh, you want them to use the tool. They're comfortable that all our documentation is written around. You can build your virtual data centers up in director and come back in and actually manage them out of the vSphere client that you've already got. Thanks, Pat. Um, Q&A time. So while you guys think up your really good hard questions, I'll uh, throw a couple softballs out there. Um, we uh, heard some applications, SharePoint, Oracle. You talked about jar files. Certainly the, the cloud has some web-oriented development uh, 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 tendencies. I mean, what, in terms of the workloads that you're seeing out there today, you know, what are the popular ones for, for maybe um, the folks in the audience to take a look at? Um, dev test, you know, what types of applications, what types of workloads seem to work best in the environments that you've, you've sort of had experience with? Probably to both of you, I guess, maybe. Go ahead. Well, uh, dev test, I mean, that, that seems to be the obvious, right, is that, um, you know, developers, especially, you know, the ability to kind of bring up a development environment and then, you know, kind of bring it down, bring it up, right? So that, that's kind of a natural, it's, it's kind of the first killer app in the cloud is the, the, the whole test. I think the, the other area is, like, again, this idea that um, people that normally didn't have access to high compute power are now having the capability, like risk, so you know, people kind of guerrilla, I, I don't want to call it guerrilla, but guerrilla risk analysis. Or, or guerrilla or, HPC or, or something or, like that, or, yeah. or, you know, in like the pharmaceutical or in the health, right? The ability to do like massively computational stuff that wasn't really possible before, so I think. Yeah, we're seeing um, greenfield applications. So uh, it, it's challenging to move things today. So sometimes it's easier, especially if you have self-service, to just start building something in the cloud to start with. Uh, the other thing is what we call the back row of the data center. So these are all the applications that everybody's forgotten about and nobody wants to manage. They were probably the first things that got virtualized uh, you know, four years ago. And um, you know, you've got your virtualization environment working really well, but storage is still expensive, air conditioners are still expensive, so if they can free up three cabinets, five cabinets, 10 cabinets in their data center by moving these low risk applications out with the ability to upload them into the environment it's, and the, the, kind of the stretched VPN networking. It's, it's, yeah, it's, it's now realistic to get those out of the data center. I, I think one other important point too is like, then you probably see this too, right? So like what's the difference between cloud and virtualization? And like, so we can both provision, you were just saying a lot of, so they're gonna move to cloud. But I find that a lot of managers tell me that the reason we went to the cloud is not because we had a provisioning problem, because we had a deprovisioning problem, right? Like servers never go away, <laughs> right, yeah. right? And so the cloud then becomes like this important mechanism to like be able to say, you know, you're going to get it for some period of time and, you know, we're going to take it away. Whereas, you know, bare metal to virtualization didn't solve that problem, right? right? There are virtual machines that just run like they're bare metal forever, right? So. Uh, maybe a, a just to sort of play on the, the eight minutes to eight weeks, you know, conversation. Um, you know, in a typical enterprise today, you have a project that comes on board and, and, you know, it takes two or three weeks to probably get the meetings with the right people. And then you have, you know, either need to find some space or order some hardware and, and you know, very quickly moves into months. I mean, what, just an example, somebody that wants to go put some apps into your environment, how long does that, that process take today in, in like the data center enterprise space? Light speed, light speed, yeah. 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 Inst so near, near anywhere instantaneous. from from give your credit card number to your Express environment to yeah. have a conversation and then get resources. Ridiculous kind of speed, right? Yeah. Well, I think that um, this is one of the challenges with cloud is, uh, or at least public cloud, is that you are trying to build a relationship, so you have to trust somebody that maybe you didn't trust before. Mm -hmm. So the longest part of the process is actually getting some kind of service agreement in place. Uh, legal, um, you know, we have cyber insurance, so do we have enough coverage for that account? There's different things different people worry about depending on uh, what industry they're in, but once that's done, you hand them the virtual data center and they go at whatever speed they're comfortable. Right. And I think that another point is like the why, why I think Blue Lock is interesting with vCloud is, and that is you know, the whole service catalog thing, right? So the, the idea that like you know, there's a great Bank of America story where, you know, they, they, they tell their, their cloud story and it, it's like, you know, people talk about, well, do you have change management when you cloud? And I got like, well, the things, everything has change management. It's just some things don't have to be manually approved, 
right? So your catalog can get decide, like I come in and I want this service, and like in the presentation, it's more the, the platinum, the gold, yeah. the silver, right? Like I get from my catalog as a user, the infrastructure decides, like does this have to go through a process yeah. of change, and does it need like eight approvals, does it need one approval, or does it need to just have a change record? Well, I, and I think that, that highlights a really important area, I think, with, with ops code, is that you're capturing the model, right? I mean, so it's the model, not the runtime. Right. And you can go in and, and modify a jar file and, and hit you know, a button and essentially recompiles its model and, and does the right thing in terms of the deployment, the, the deployment action. Yeah, no, I think that like, there's a bank that I worked with years ago and they joke that, so I, I did Tivoli services and, and so every time I call them, like, how long has it taken? It's a, they needed a server in the pack rim, right? And it was like, every time I call them, it's like six months, it's a year, 18 months to get a server, like not eight weeks. 18 months to get a provision <laughs> server, and why? Because it's, gotta, it's this handoff. I've got to give it to the storage management right. guys. Is it done yet? I've got to give it to the security guy. So if you can encapsulate all those rules in one place Absolutely. and still get the benefit, then it becomes yeah. eight minutes. Absolutely. Right? So my, my last question, um, you've been looking at Redwood for a year. Um, I know we've had a lot of activities in terms of getting a the, the, the vCloud data center environment up, just in terms of your experience, design considerations, um, gotchas, uh, things to look at on the networking, storage, any, any sort of thoughts in, in you know, how, to, how to design a cloud that you can give some, some feedback to the, the guys here? Yeah, we had, um, uh, so one thing is our, our chief engineer is actually in the room, so if anybody wants to go really deep, they don't let me log in anything anymore. At some Blue shirt. Point, they took my password away. <laughs> but um, you know, we, we really had to rethink the way that we were going to build the environment underneath the software. So probably the, the most interesting about uh, Director was that it gave us a tremendous amount of capability to configure different service levels, different types of infrastructures, let the user have control of pieces of it. And that was great, and, you know, kind of an instant sale in our minds that that's exactly what people are asking for, that's what we need to deliver. But then when you look at, oh my God, we're gonna have to deliver something really flexible and scalable mm -hmm. underneath. Um, you know, probably one of the biggest decisions we made is we went with the Cisco Nexus platform for our networking, and it kind of abolished the concept of VLANs uh, in terms of uh, spanning tree problems and all that, they just kind of went away. So there might be some changes uh, as you think about getting this capability, if somebody really does start to grow their assets and build big environments, right. uh, you know, one of your end users or one of your departments or one of your customers, the impact that they might have on a uh, less than flexible infrastructure underneath the software uh, you know, could be severe. Makes sense. Um, you know, I would say the whole just developer, you know, developers best practices, you know, assume that IP addresses could change. I mean, all that type of stuff in terms of deploying to a cloud is, is important as well. Um, I, I think that's a, there's a hidden, uh, almost the, the opposite thing where we had, to, we had to build a much more flexible infrastructure mm -hmm. to support the variety of things right. people could do. I, I think we're going to see the opposite issue occur for the developers. And it's, it's happening in the public cloud today where it's very easy to get an infrastructure up and running. Right. But then it scales past a point where a, a developer wants to even bother trying to make it right. still work. Right, right. And they go back to IT and try to un unload it. And I think we're, we're helping that problem by giving people more control that necessarily, uh, was it, with great power comes great responsibility. <laughs> As a great power becomes great training. Um, and a lot of people don't have it, right. and it may not be their core purpose to learn how to run an infrastructure. Well, and I think that brings up a good point in terms of, of you know, you, you, you sort of go to Amazon today, you kind of get what they have, right? I mean, by default, you know, it's, a, it's a, an offering, and if you don't want it, then you go someplace else. So I think you know, you've got an advantage where you can kind of, you know, you can give a more bespoke sort of um, service level agreement uh, as well as configuration. You know, the complexity in, in, v, in vCloud Director networking is there to support all these different configurations, to be able to hook up a VPN, to use you know, different security features. Um, so certainly a big, uh, a big feature there. Do you have any, yeah, any no, comments? Yeah, no, I, I on... think that, you know, one of the things I've been very impressed, so like I, I, you know, I wasn't under NDA, so most of what I learned about vCloud was today, right? So, <laughs> um, but you know, the, but you know, we all know we've, we've all been hearing about it for a while, right? And there was vCloud version 08 or 8, whatever. But the the thing is, is that um, what what impressed me, if I compare it to like some of the other clouds out there, or even Amazon. So I've been a fanboy of Amazon for years because 
what they did for the startup world and web ops, right? You, you can't deny them yeah. the respect for that. Um, but what, what vCloud does to me is something that Amazon and a lot of the commodity uh, clouds don't do is treat like, like compute power is compute power, right? We get that, right? Every cloud has compute power. But like a lot of the other clouds, to a certain extent, treat storage as a second class citizen and certainly um, network, right? I mean, like in some cases non-existent. Right. And I think the most impressive thing to me about vCloud versus other clouds, either private clouds, things like Eucalyptus or, or Amazon is that like vCloud addresses the more enterprisey nature of treating storage as a first class citizen and treating um, and even security as a, you know, as, as a citizen, right? I think, you know, V-Shield, right? We'll, right? we'll see where it goes, but I mean, certainly network as a first class citizen based on what you guys have done and, and what I've seen today, so. Yeah, that's, a, um, again, a lesson learned for us was the V-Shield networking, or the V-Shield security features and how it affected the way that you did networking. So it's really powerful, the idea that you can go in and create firewalls around a VM, around a V-App, around a virtual data center but now you have firewalls all over the place. Right, yeah. right. And um, you get sort of into that synchronization process that, that John was talking about in terms of the load balancers, right? The firewalls yeah, and exactly other things right. needs to be synchronized. Yeah. yeah, it's almost like you need a, a core configuration that everything provision gets a configuration configured management solution. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> um, and then the ability to allow somebody to come in and tweak it specifically for that application use. All right, so I, we have about 12 minutes left. Um, any, any questions from, from the audience? You're, you're first. Sure, so um, it's pretty clear that tools and the training around the tools is a pretty important thing about the work. And that's not lost on me. I'm aware of such a Yeah, I think that, you know, there, there's, I mean, we're, we're in for inevitable convergence of the enterprise and web ops, right? I mean, like, I, the guys, like, it, you know, the Velocity is a conference by O'Reilly, right, which is the web ops at, at light speed and all that, right? So they'll say boldly, I won't say this, that web ops is the new IT infrastructure paradigm, right? And, and so, so, that, so, I mean, whether you believe that or not, and I'm not sure I'm convinced yet, right? Because, but the bottom line is, like, what I know is absolutely true is there's going to be a, a crash of, like, traditional IT service management, the things that are really great about that, and then what these guys are doing. I mean, if you look at, like, a company like Farmville right, or Zynga, right? Like, it, it's insanity over there. Right? I mean, less than two years old. You know, they, they're doing like 50, 60 million a month in revenue. I mean, they've probably broken 100,000 servers or instances. I mean, it's just like insanity, you know. And, and then you look at the Facebooks and the uh, Twitters and all these guys. Same thing, right? Like, they're doing phenomenal things with large web scale. They're not as complex as the enterprise. But we need to, from the enterprise, if I put my enterprise hat on, we need to take a lot of lessons from them, right? We need to look at, like, what are the... <laughs> I get long-winded, but the, the thing is, is like, I, I always think of the, like, the, the web ops guys that goes and sits in the enterprise conference and says, oh, those guys don't even know about this tool, that tool, they don't even know they can use this. But then, but then the enterprise guy goes into the, the velocity and sees yeah. a guy like, you know, um, John Ospar from Etsy, right, who's like famous in the DevOps world, or, and, and they look like, what, he's just getting that change management is important? <laughs> you know, like, right? So that's the marriage that, yeah. that is inevitable. It's like we need to, like, we, all, we need to, like, switch hats and start looking at what, what are the great things that bolt size have. Is that, that kind of answer? Yeah. Do you have enough runway for you guys to get big, get relevant? And yeah, I, I think it's, yeah, I mean, yeah, you know, from your mouth to God's ears, but, uh, but the, <laughs> But they I, are but hiring I, a chief revenue officer, I noticed. That's, on the that's website. Right. So if you've no, got anybody, talk to John. But, but the important thing is that, like, I think it's inevitable, whether it's us or it's some technology that takes over what we're doing, that, you know, these, these principles that are coming out of web ops are important things that the enterprise needs to pay attention to. Yes.
What is that, Ben? Anything else? Anything else for you guys? No. Thank you. Good. Yeah. Yeah. Thanks. Thanks for for coming and appreciate your time. Yeah. Fill out the the forms before you leave. Um, and uh, thanks again for coming. <laughs>